welcome to the live radio broadcast of New Baptist Church located at 610 28th Street in Huntington. You could come join us this morning for our morning worship service at 11 o'clock. Um, our evening services are on Wednesday, 6 o'clock for the youth and the Awana. Awana will start after Labor Day, so we got one more week before Awana starts. But the youth still meet at 6 o'clock, and, and, the, the, children. and the children meet at 6 o'clock for their summer program. Um, even though school's already started, we just go summer program until it's time for Awana. And uh, youth Bible, adult Bible studies start at 6.30. Uh, will you join us as Jim leads us in prayer? Thank you, and good morning. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Lord, he is the honey in the rock, as the song says. He is our everything. Lord, help us to um, praise him and give honor and glory. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that uh, you point the direction to him, and not on the Holy Spirit itself, but on, on your son, Jesus. Lord, I'd ask that the Holy Spirit would uh, be with Pastor Robin today as he brings our message. Be with us as we listen. Lord, I um, ask that you would touch our hearts and our minds and our souls with your word and give us a hunger and a thirst to read and um, absorb and to honor your word in everything we do. Lord, help us to be a witness uh, for others. Help us to invite people to church and to Sunday school. Help us not to be shy about it, Lord. Lord, just be with us today. Um, be with all the pastors as they bring your word be with the um, folks listening, either on uh, in person. Uh, we love that fellowship with each other, Lord, that we have with you during the actual church service. Be with those who can't be at church service today, that they can listen and, and uh, watch live streaming. Lord, just go with us. Forgive us when we sin in thought, word, and deed. deed. Just be with all the uh, musicians today as they play and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Jim. No, Jim's better half. <laughs> oh, we don't know where there's going to be a discussion about that. Lisa, who plays for us every week, and we appreciate her so much doing the opening. Now she's going to do the special music. so much, Lisa. Our message this morning is Pastor Robert. Oh, well, let me add my welcome to you and say how glad we are that you've joined us here uh, at, the, at New Baptist at the Radio Bible Class. And my guess is from week to week, you did not know that uh, He Lives can be played in so many different styles. <laughs> uh, and uh, I want you to know, I appreciate Lisa and what she brings, I said, even before uh, we got on the radio today, she was giving us a little Hebrew uh, feel to that song. And 
and then she, she just plays, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, again, uh, you're welcome, and uh, let me invite you, if you're not part of a local congregation, if you're looking for a church home, we are at 610 28th Street, and that's uh, uh, off of 5th Avenue, and it's the old skating rink <laughs> uh, there across from east of, from what used to be Huntington East High School. Uh, but we would invite you to come Sunday morning uh, at 11 o'clock. We have our uh, worship service, and uh, that is also live streamed, and you can get a uh, a link to that on our church website at newbaptistchurch.com. We really are glad that you are with us today. And this morning we are continuing the series of lessons that uh, where we've been taking just the lives of some different people in the scripture and saying, what can we learn from certain events uh, in their lives? And today uh, we're going to look at the life of uh, the Apostle Paul, or at least a little bit of it. Uh, but as we begin, let me ask you a question. Uh, what do you do when it seems the Lord is changing your plans? When you plan to do one thing and the Lord decides you're to do something else? How do you know it's the Lord and not the evil one just trying to tempt you away from what the Lord really wants? Well, those are questions and issues we live with every day, isn't it? If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to Acts chapter 15, uh, and we're going to read in from 15, the end of 15, end of 16, and, and see uh, how Paul handled that particular kind of a situation. Starting in verse 36 of chapter 15 of Acts, uh, Luke, the historian, writes it this way. After some days... Paul said to Barnabas, now they've finished their first missionary journey. Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Let me rephrase that. Paul didn't want to take John Mark with him because John Mark had tubed out on him on the first missionary journey. He had wimped out and went home. And there arose, starting in verse 39, a sharp disagreement so that they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Starting in chapter 16. Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them uh, for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in their faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went uh, through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing through Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And Paul had seen the vision, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Pray with me. Father, I give you thanks for your word, and I thank you for events in the lives of people uh, in the scriptures that can teach us lessons. And I pray, Lord, that we would learn lessons today about how to trust you to lead us. Now, Lord, I, I thank you 
I pray you'd open our spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have for us as individuals. But also, Lord, you'd open our heart to understand it. And then, God, give us courage in our wills to obey you. Now, do your work in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder what can we glean from this event in the life of Paul that will help us in our daily lives. Well, in the context, here we are. Paul is ready to begin his second missionary journey with Barnabas. But again, as I said, uh, he had a fallen out uh, with uh, Barnabas uh, over John Mark coming along. Uh, and again, remember, John Mark had left them. Uh, he went home and Paul, I think, is saying he didn't want to drag around dead weight. So he said, nope, not, not coming with me. And Barnabas said, well, he's coming with me. And Paul and Barnabas said had a sharp disagreement. And so Barnabas took John Mark, sailed to Cyprus. Paul took Silas, went on their way. This is the last mention of Barnabas in the scriptures. Now, it's interesting because so far it had been Barnabas and then Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, oh, then Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, and now it's just Paul. We, we don't hear any more about Barnabas. Now, we know they went to Cyprus, but we don't know any more about Barnabas after that statement. But we do learn more about John Mark. John, God is not finished with John Mark, and neither was Paul. At the end of Paul's life, and you can read this later in the, in the Scriptures, in the New Testament, Paul, nearing his death, calls for John Mark to be sent to him. He had a task for him. God was not finished with John Mark. Paul recognized that and sent for him later. So all was not lost, and there was John Mark as an important person. And in fact, uh, John Mark is the one who was the author of Mark, the gospel. That's the John Mark we're talking about. So their relationship had been restored. Paul gave him a task. We're not exactly sure what that was. But we know that John Mark went on to write what we know to be the Gospel of Mark. Now, it was Paul's plan to revisit the churches that he and Barnabas had visited and had started and had planted in their first journey. He wanted to visit and strengthen them some more. Paul had built friendships and relationships in these churches. He wanted to work with those folks some more. He wanted to, to build into them. His plan uh, and intent was to go where he'd been and then to plant other churches in those areas, but to do that where he'd been, where he was known, where he'd had an impact before. But in the passages we just read, the Lord prevented Paul from preaching in Asia. Now, we don't know why, but the Lord thwarted his efforts to go where he had been and directed him to go somewhere else. Paul wanted to stay in what is now modern Turkey, but the Lord wanted him to go in what is today modern Greece. In Troas, Paul had a vision and understood it to be a call from God to go to a new place and preach the gospel to a new people. Paul was sensitive enough to God's spirit and followed his leading, even when it wasn't what Paul had planned. Now, that's where we are today. So how do we know that? How do we follow the Spirit's leading? How do we know when to shift gears, to shift direction, when we are going one direction and think that's where God wants us to go, but when God begins to want to change where we're headed? How do we know that? Well, we call that being led by the Spirit. And to be led by the Spirit means that you're following the Spirit. Now, that, that, that doesn't take rocket science, does it? But to be led by the Spirit means you're following the Spirit. We don't bargain or demand or direct the Spirit. We simply follow. Now, we might question, but we are also to listen for answers and directions. It's not wrong to question or to ask those questions, uh, but when it's just to avoid doing what God wants you to do, then that becomes wrong. To be led by the Spirit, 
you must be committed to do what the Spirit prompts you to do. Now, let me kind of flesh that out a minute. We've got to be willing to do what the Spirit prompts us to do. Because I don't think God will reveal his will to you in order to get your approval for it. So many people want and they pray like this, well, God, tell me your will for me. And the idea is, and then I'll decide if I want to do it or not. And I got news. I don't think God will ever reveal his will to folks who want to, want to have the up or down, the veto on it. I don't think you'll ever know the leading of God's spirit until you're ready to go where he wants you to go. Regardless. Many of you and many of us want to make bargain, bargains with the Lord. Well, I will do this if, Lord, you will do that. Some make demands. I can remember own, in my own life. Started my ministry after I graduated from college on the staff of Campus Crusade at University of Mississippi at Ole Miss. From there, I went to California. I came back from there and went to West Virginia. I thought this is as far north as I ever cared to live. And I said, Lord, I'll do what you want. I'm just as far north as I want to live. I was then called to First Baptist Church in Wheeling, West Virginia. That was north of where I was in West Virginia. Lord, I'm as far north as I ever care to live. Now, I'll follow you wherever you want me to go, but I don't want to go any further north. And then I was called to Michigan. I, I decided I wasn't going to pray that no more north stuff because I figured the next one was Canada or Alaska. Uh, or the Arctic Circle. So uh, I just quit praying that way. Now, I laugh at that, and, and you may too, but you see how we say those things, and we try to bargain with God, and we try to say, well, God, if you will, I will, and his will is not that way. His will is not that way. To walk in the Spirit means you trust the Lord to guide your steps. Remember, Moses was called to lead the people a troubled people out of slavery to the promised land. Their journey took a strange turn and Moses led them through the wilderness for 40 years. But as they approached the promised land, God told Moses <laughs> he had a different leader that was going to lead them into the promised land. Moses could see it, but he couldn't enter it. Now that's a whole another story for another day. But he called Joshua. Joshua would be the leader to lead the people. And in Joshua, the first chapter of Joshua, the book of Joshua, we read this verse. Uh, now, this is the Crouch translation. Josh, my man Moses is dead. And you're the man now. Everywhere the sole of your foot steps, I have given that land to you. Did you catch that? Joshua, you're the leader now. And everywhere the sole of your footsteps, I've given that land to you. The sole of the foot. Not the sole of the sandal or your boot, but the sole of your foot. You know, in boots, you'll step almost anywhere without any, without any fear of anything hurting your foot. But when you're barefoot, you're pretty careful where you put your foot down, aren't you? Well, this is the sole of your foot. And as God's spirit places my foot, I can trust that. And that land was his. It wasn't where he wanted to go. It's where God wanted him to go. And God directed his steps. That's what it means to walk in the spirit. You let the spirit set your foot down with each step. One after the other. And you follow him. So as I'm walking in the spirit, what happens? Well, I believe that as I walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will close wrong doors at the right time. Would it have been wrong for Paul to preach and plant churches in Asia? No. Except God wanted him somewhere else. I've often told people that, you know, if I don't follow God's call, I've messed up two places, where I am and where I ought to be. And you see, this is what is happening. And God says, no, nah, it's not wrong for you to preach in Asia. It's just not where I want you to be. So God closes doors at the right time. 
God closed the doors to where Paul wanted to go in order to get him where he wanted him to be. Now, why should we trust the Holy Spirit? Why should you do that? Well, we re must remember that the Holy Spirit is God. Remember, the Holy Spirit is one a part of the triune God. He is timeless. He knows the future and the past. He's boundless. He's everywhere all the time, and he's peerless. He has unlimited power and provision. The Spirit knows the whole picture of God's plan that we only see in part. You see, God sees the whole thing from eternity past to eternity future. He sees it as a unit. We see it chronologically, moment by moment. So why not trust the one who sees it all? That's what it means. I think also that the Holy Spirit will open the right doors at the right time. The Spirit will direct you where he wants you to be. And I believe that if you follow him, you will do so and you will have clarity in those decisions. Now, I will be honest with you. A lot of that is by faith. You know, uh, sometimes I can look back and say, yes, it was absolutely God's will for me to be at this place or that place. But when I went there, I went there saying, I believe this is where God wants me to be. And so I'm going. I trust it's where God wants me. It's the best I understand his will, his direction in my life. But it's as I look back over it that I can be fully assured it's where I should have been. Those kind of things. The Holy Spirit will lead you step by step, even when you don't know the way. But I also think that God will call you through the unexpected door. He'll close them at the right time, open them at the right time. But it might be an unexpected door. The vision of the Macedonian man calling for help was quite unexpected for Paul. Paul never thought he would be going to Europe, and yet it was just where the Lord wanted him. Paul had other plans, but was obedient to the Spirit's leading. The Spirit often does the unexpected. The day of Pentecost. Tongues of fire and everyone hearing in their own language. The earthquake shaking the early church's prayer meetings. The dividing of Paul and Barnabas. <laughs> we see that as division and the Holy Spirit saw it as doubling the missionary work. And then I think of my own call to pastoral ministry. You know, I never intended to preach. My intent was to be on the college campus. And yet the Lord led me to a, a pulpit ministry in Wheeling, and I was there 13 years. I never intended to leave West Virginia, but was called to First Baptist Church in Charlotte, Michigan, and I was there 12 years. And then I retired and was able to move back home. And incredibly enough, I've been here at New Baptist, and it'll be nine years in November. <laughs> That's hard to believe. You see, the Spirit does unexpected, but also empowers us to follow. It's the Spirit is working out His plan, and His plan is not necessarily yours or mine, but He's working out God's plan. Living your life for the Lord is a great adventure. It has many twists and turns along the way. As long as you follow, there will be times when your faith will be stretched and you'll need to walk through those unexpected doors. But as you do, understand that God does incredible things as you follow wherever he leads. Now, the Holy Spirit will not lead you contrary to the word, to God's word in the Bible. The Holy Spirit gave us God's word through men who wrote it as prompting. He will not violate the word in his leading. I've had people, I mean, incredibly say, well, God told me, and it's in absolute contradiction to God's word. Well, I got news. You might have heard it, but it wasn't God who told you that. 
I've had people, I've had men and women sit in my office and tell me that God had told them they needed to divorce the one they were married to and marry the one they really loved. Yeah, sounds really good, doesn't it? When you can say, God told me to do this, <laughs> but I got news. God doesn't tell you to do that. That didn't come from God. He will never violate the holy word that he's already given us. He will always lead you toward God, never away, toward what is right and what is clear, never to what is wrong and what is cloudy. He will never lead you contrary to the perfect word he's given. So what about God's will in your life? Well, I will tell you this, it's better than you could ever imagine. Truth is, I thought nothing could ever be any better than campus ministry. How exciting is it to be in the academic community? And the people who come to your group, they want to be there. It's not like church where some are brought, you know, some guys come only because the woman they're with tells them they won't kiss them if they don't go to church with them. You got all kinds of people who come. Uh, but boy, in campus, in college, they only come if they want to. That, that's a highly motivated congregation, group of people. But then God took me to the pulpit ministry, to a church as a pastor. But my life has been blessed by that call. I never thought I'd move. If I, I thought if I ever moved, it'd be to another church in West Virginia when I was here. And <laughs> here we were known and respected for our ministries. Becky and I never expected, considered, never even let, considered leaving West Virginia because it's where my wife also had her ministry. She was on our West Virginia Baptist Convention staff and Golly, we, but from the day we got married, we wanted to serve on a church staff together, and it just wasn't happening here. And then, out of the blue, Michigan. <laughs> An unexpected call. But I can tell you that God's will is always better than you expect. We had no idea how blessed we would be for the 12 years we had in Michigan. It's not always easy or pleasant. You know that Macedonian caller for Paul? <laughs> he might have been that jailer. It's where Paul and Silas ended up. God's call led them to jail in troubled times. You may have to leave the comfort of home, go to a new place, but know this. The Lord will never lead you where His grace cannot keep you. Let me close with this quote from the great uh, second baseman of the New York Yankees, a Hall of Famer, Bobby Richardson. He offered this short prayer. Dear God, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. Let that be our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.